Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today we are returning to the microwave background. Longtime viewers will know that I have already produced 17 videos on the topic. That is because it is so important. In the next few videos we will put the topic to rest. Let's begin by discussing what has and has not been measured by the various satellites which have attempted to measure the microwave background. The American COBE satellite was launched in 1989 in a polar orbit at an altitude of 900 kilometers. That sounds far away, but remember that the Earth has a diameter of nearly 13,000 kilometers. COBE orbited at only one-fifth of one percent of the distance to the Moon. COBE is the only satellite which has actually measured the supposed cosmic microwave background. The satellite carried three instruments, the Ferris horn, the differential microwave radiometer, or DMR, and the Diffuse Infrared Background Experiment, or DERBY, which measured infrared signal and isn't central to our discussion of the microwave background. The Ferris horn, headed by John Mather, was the first and only satellite-based instrument that ever gave us the monopole spectrum of the background. This is important because Ferris confirmed the results of Penzias and Wilson and demonstrated that the famous 2.7 Kelvin curve was indeed of thermal origin. This is the only spectrum that matters relative to the proof of the cosmic microwave background and therefore the Big Bang. When it comes to the monopole spectrum, the fierce horn on COBE measured it with ease. It had an absolutely phenomenal signal to noise. In fact, the signal was so strong that in order to see the error bars at all, they had to be expanded by a factor of 400. Cosmologists stumbled into confirmation bias and celebrated the incredible strength of this signal. But thinking critically, it should have been a red flag. Powerful signals imply proximal sources. If this signal originated from the Big Bang, it should not be so overwhelmingly strong as it must fill the entire universe. That is a tremendous amount of required power. I have also emphasized in this video that it takes a lattice to produce a thermal or blackbody spectrum, and the Big Bang never met this important requirement. As a result, it is impossible that the monopole spectrum has anything to do with cosmology. The nearest object able to generate that signal was in fact the Earth. Water is known to be a powerful microwave absorber, and good absorbers are also good emitters. And as I don't need to tell you, we have a lot of water on Earth. It is a fact that most, if not all, of the microwave background measurements obtained near or on the Earth were subject to tremendous problems associated with water. I have reviewed many of these in this paper on the COBE satellite, which is linked below. I will be discussing water's properties further in an upcoming video. That should help everyone understand how water at 300 Kelvin can produce a thermal signal at 3 Kelvin. To defend a cosmological assignment to COBE's monopole measurement, some will point out that the COBE satellite has a shield. Thus, there is no way that the signal from the Earth could affect COBE's measurement. However, that shield was never designed to protect the satellite from microwaves. It was a heat shield intended to protect the COBE instruments from being heated by infrared radiation from the Earth. As far as microwaves are concerned, the shield was essentially non-existent. It may even have facilitated diffraction of microwave signals into the Ferris instrument. Remember, the monopole must be present at every single point in the universe in order to support Big Bang Theory. Our galaxy and the billions of other galaxies in the universe are constantly producing microwave signals, but these signals have nothing whatsoever to do with the Big Bang. That is why you can generate an anisotropy map as generated by other satellites, but without a monopole signal. There is no connection between those maps and an overarching Big Bang theory. Speaking of maps that have nothing to do with the Big Bang, let's discuss WMAP and Planck. These satellites were launched by NASA in a collaboration between NASA and the European Space Agency, respectively. They orbited at a point known as the second Lagrangian point, or L2. This point is positioned 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. Critically, neither of these satellites ever measured a monopole spectrum at that location. Launched in 2001, WMAP was a differential instrument with five frequency channels operating at 23, 33, 41, 61, and 94 gigahertz. Here are the frequencies sampled by WMAP at L2 with respect to the plot of the microwave background monopole obtained by the fierce horn near the Earth. But remember, WMAP could only measure differences between microwave signals in the sky as we discussed in these videos. It was never designed to simply measure the microwave background directly. 
Therefore, it could never prove that the microwave background existed that far from Earth. Planck was launched in 2009. Its low-frequency instrument, or LFI, was comprised of three channels operating as pseudo-differential radiometers at 30, 44, and 70 gigahertz. The LFI measured differences between the sky and a reference load operating near 4 Kelvin on the satellite. I have highlighted in this video that the 4K loads on the Planck satellite did not properly function as black bodies. In fact, they acted as resonators, which means that the LFI on Planck could never properly accomplish its task. I hope to return to this critical point soon. In any event, Planck's LFI never measured a monopole because it was a differential instrument. Planck additionally carried on board a high-frequency instrument comprised of six channels in the form of bolometers operating at 100, 143, 217, 353, 545, and 857 GHz. In order to help make things clear again, here are the frequencies sampled by the LFI channels at L2 with respect to the plot of the microwave background monopole obtained by the fierce horn near the Earth. Next, here is where the Planck HFI frequencies are located. Unlike the LFI, the six HFI bolometers on the Planck satellite measured absolute signal in the sky and should clearly have been able to measure the monopole at L2. Yet the Planck team stated that their HFI was unable to measure the monopole at L2 due to contaminating signals from the Planck telescope mirrors and other instruments. Here is what they said. Planck cannot accurately measure the monopole uniform part of the emission because many sources contribute, telescope, horns, filters. That is an incredible claim when you think about microwave background science. Both the WMAP and Planck team claim that they can remove signal from the galaxy around us in order to obtain their anisotropy maps. In reality, they can never properly characterize the contributions of the galaxy to the overall microwave signal. Yet at the same time, the Planck team now claims to be unable to account for signals arising from their own instrument. Signals tend to over 100,000 light years away scattered throughout various astrophysical phenomena are supposedly subtracted from the image with surgical precision. But the telescope's horns and filters, which were designed by the Planck team themselves and could be measured for expected contamination in the laboratory before launch, were just too complex for the team to ever figure out. The horn of the Penzias and Wilson instrument was on the Earth's surface and somehow could detect signal despite the Earth's atmosphere and the fact that the instrument was literally not designed to detect the microwave background in the first place. The COBE team, for their part, had no problem with excluding signals from their horns and filters on their satellite. Indeed, their experiment showed that Planck should have been awash in extremely powerful signal which could not be missed. The truth of the matter wasn't that their horns, telescopes, and filters were the problem. It's that they couldn't measure that signal at L2 because they were one and a half million miles away from the Earth, which is where that signal actually originates. Despite the fact that WMAP was never designed to measure the microwave background directly and Planck was unable to do so, people often state that WMAP and Planck measured the microwave background at L2. What these two satellites did do was measure small microwave differences in the sky and generate what cosmologists refer to as an isotropy maps. Here they are. But despite the claims of the cosmologists, I believe that these maps have limited cosmological significance. I've already addressed the inability to properly remove the galactic foreground in generating these anisotropy maps. Remember that this is what the galactic contamination looks like for the three highest frequency channels on the WMAP satellite. The red band at the center of the images correspond to the galaxy. The WMAP team, in an act of deception by omission, does not even show us the galactic contamination for its lowest two channels, because those maps would be completely red. It is absolutely impossible to remove the galactic contamination from these maps despite the claims of the cosmologists. Claiming to do so would be like claiming to have measured the background radiation in daily life while conducting the experiment in front of Chernobyl's melted down reactor. Secondly, I have mentioned in the past that there is no such thing as a unique anisotropy map. The anisotropy maps are generated by taking a linear combination of data from each channel and summing everything together. This was first done by the DMR on the COBE satellite, which produced the first microwave anisotropy map. Yet anyone can come up with their own linear combination. That is why no unique map exists. Thirdly, I have emphasized that when the WMAP and Planck team invert their sky signals in order to take their linear combinations, they are violating the third laws of thermodynamics. 
This is because they are inferring that regions in the sky can have a negative absolute temperature, which is physically impossible. More precisely, they claim that the same region in the sky can have positive temperatures in one channel and negative temperatures in another channel. Talk about being deceived by mathematics. Fourth, the anisotropy maps also lack signal to noise. And fifth, this is compounded by the fact that anisotropy maps are not stable from year to year. If these maps were truly of cosmological origin and showing us the origins of the universe, then the maps must be stable. I have demonstrated that the Planck team maps possess no year-to-year -year stability, and without it, one cannot claim to be examining features which have anything to do with cosmology. I intend to return to this important topic soon. Now, let us return to the COBE satellite. In addition to the Ferris horn, COBE carried differential microwave radiometers, or the DMR instrument, operating at 31.4, 53, and 90 gigahertz. The DMR was designed and headed by George Smoot. The DMR measured the dipole of the microwave background with an amplitude of about 3.5 millikelvin, a feature associated with motion of the local group of galaxies. If you know calculus, there is a relationship between the monopole measured by the fierce horn and the dipole measured by the DMR. The dipole is the first derivative of the monopole. As such, provided you know the velocity of the local group, thought to be about 600 kilometers per second, and can measure the dipole directly, you should be able to calculate the monopole. Conversely, if the monopole is measured, one can know the value of the dipole. So the WMAP and Planck satellites, which had differential systems analogous to the DMR on COBE, should have been able to measure a dipole, and if so, we should be able to calculate the value of the monopole at L2. But unfortunately, that never happened, as I first described in this video. So what did happen? Well, both the WMAP and Planck teams did present a dipole amplitude confirming the DMR. So why not give us a monopole temperature? Well, what they actually did was take the known value of the monopole spectrum measured by the Kobe Furious horn. From that spectral temperature and the known velocity of the local group, they calculated the expected dipole spectrum at L2. Remember, the dipole corresponds to the first derivative of the monopole. That derivative is then evaluated at the monopole temperature, namely the 2.7 Kelvin determined by the Kobe team. So by choosing the monopole temperature as the point to evaluate the dipole, the WMAP and Planck team have forced the dipole temperature to be that of the monopole. They then use this knowledge to calibrate their frequency channels relative to each other. Therefore, the monopole from Kobe was used to evaluate the dipole, which then served to calibrate the WMAP and Planck satellites. As a result, the dipole could not be used to measure the monopole at L2. That is why a monopole value has never been published at L2 by these teams. One cannot use a signal for calibration and then again for computation. In the end, the WMAP and Planck team never made an independent determination of the dipole at L2 and as a result they could not compute a monopole. So now, devoid of both a measured dipole and monopole, it is clear that no evidence has ever been presented that a monopole exists at L2. Consequently, it is improper to claim that the microwave background with cosmological significance has ever been measured at L2. Now, I have noticed that some people confuse this paper by Fixen as evidence that the monopole has been measured at L2. However, that paper uses WMAP velocity data from the dipole and then combines that with COBE data in order to refine the monopole value measured by the COBE satellite near the Earth. It does not present an independent measurement of the monopole at L2. Finally, let's discuss the Russian satellite RELIT-1 launched in 1983. I have already addressed this satellite in detail. Like WMAP and Planck, RELIT-1 was a narrowband differential instrument, but operated at a single frequency of 37 gigahertz. The RELIT horns were corrugated in order to provide a relatively sharp bandwidth of 0.4 gigahertz. The goal of the RELIT mission was to measure the dipole of the microwave background, but it also measured the galactic signal. Initially, RELIT reported a dipole of 2.1 plus or minus 0.5 millikelvin, and that number was eventually revised beyond the initial error bars to 3.15 plus or minus 0.12 millikelvin. For me, the key feature of the RELIT mission was not its attempt to measure the dipole, as its data quality was rapidly eclipsed by COBE. The concern stems from contamination produced by the Earth. Here again is what the Russians wrote. In spite of the high apogee of the RELIT-1 experiment orbit and rather low level of its antenna side lobes, we observed a large contribution of the Moon's and the Earth's thermal emission to antenna temperature. Thus, the RELIT-2 experiment cannot have an orbit such as the orbit of the RELIT-1. So the Soviets were cautioning other scientists about contamination from the Earth. 
Everyone should now have a pretty clear understanding of what the COBE, WMAP, Planck, and Relit satellites have measured. To summarize, the monopole of the microwave background has only been measured by COBE in Earth orbit. It has never been measured at L2 by WMAP or Planck, or in elliptical orbit by Relit. The dipole has only been independently measured by COBE since it possessed both the FIRUS and the DMR. The dipole has not been independently measured by WMAP and Planck satellites. Rather, these satellites calibrated their instruments using the COBE FIRUS monopole value to fix the dipole. Amplitudes of the dipole have been measured for all four satellites including COBE, WMAP, Planck, and RELIT. Anisotropy maps were first produced by the COBE DMR team and then by the WMAP and Planck team. These anisotropy maps have questionable value in science for at least five reasons. First, inability to properly remove the galactic foreground. Second, the lack of uniqueness. Third, violation of the third law. Fourth, extremely low signal to noise. And five, lack of stability. Thank you all for watching to the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, promote the channel. Mention the videos to your friends and to your local astronomy club. Support me with a like and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.